Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This is Jason Watt from Business Career College. And what we're going to talk about today, we're going to enhance our understanding of RRSPs a little bit by looking at some RRSP math. I know everybody always gets all excited about the concept of doing some math, but we do have to go through some here in order to understand a little bit better how the RRSP works to see some of its characteristics and how they benefit us. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at somebody's income. So let's say that we have income in this case for the 2013 year. And my taxpayer in this case has the following sources of income. We'll give them salary of let's say $88,000. We'll say they earn a bonus of how about $8,000? They have some dividend income of $3,000. That is income earned as a result of owning shares and being paid a, a chunk of the after-tax profit from those shares. They have rental income of how about $14,000 and they have rental losses or rental expenses of $8,000 and as it happens this person is paying spousal support to another person so we'll have paid alimony or spousal support we'll say they're paying $12,000 of that. So what happens first here is we have to determine what we're trying to actually answer. So a common exam question here would be what is the 2014 RRSP deduction limit? Very common type of exam question. And it is important that you look at the years here. The 2013 year's income is going to determine the 2014 deduction limit. Okay, so that's the question you're dealing with. You know you're dealing with 2013's income to determine 2014's deduction limit. Okay, so now we have to determine what income we're actually going to include here. So the salary, are we going to include salary? Yes, that is an example of earned income and we would include that. The bonus is another example of earned income and would be included. The dividend though is not considered earned income for this purpose and would not be included. And then with the rental amounts, we include the net amount. So 14,000 less 8,000, we would include here 6,000. And the alimony paid, curiously, reduces your RRSP deduction limit. So in the end, for this taxpayer, we would take 88,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,000 minus 12,000. That will give us $90,000 on which to base our RRSP calculation. You'll remember, of course, that we're going to use 18% of the earned income, so $90,000 times 18% gives us $16,200. In and of itself, that will be the answer to this question if there's no further information provided. However, that would be an unusual situation. This would be a fairly simple question in and of itself. The only thing that students would sometimes get caught up on here is which amounts, especially out of these bottom four, which amounts contribute to and which amounts reduce the RSP deduction room. That is something you generally have to be aware of. Now, you might have another scenario at play here or another bit of information available. We might also be told that this person is a member of a defined benefit pension. 
at some levels, at the CFP and mutual funds exam levels, for example, you do have to know the formula for a DB pension. At the LLQP level, you don't need to know it. You just need to recognize what happens when you have what's called a pension adjustment. And the pension adjustment in this case, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that it's $10,400. So what happens then is that pension adjustment represents the combination of this taxpayer and their employer's contribution to defined benefit plans for this year. And because the defined benefit plan uses a very similar set of rules to the RRSP, almost identical in fact, we're going to use both of those items together to figure out the RRSP room. So in fact, that $10,400 pension adjustment knocks down this person's RSP room, and this person will now have $5,800. And if we have this information available, this is now the right answer. $5,800 is the right answer to this question. Okay, now, there are a couple more things that we have to be aware of here. The first is that we can carry this forward. And under current RRSP rules, we can carry this forward indefinitely. So if you don't use your RRSP room this year, you can carry it forward. Or the other thing that you might consider here is the ability to over-contribute to the RRSP. Normally, when you go beyond your RRSP deduction limit, you have a 1% penalty per month on the amount over. However, we do have the lifetime over contribution allowance. And what the lifetime over contribution allowance allows for us to do for RRSP contributors over the age of 18 is to put an extra $2,000 into their RRSP that's not tax deductible. However, it doesn't create any penalties either. Now, you can't do that every year. You can only do that really once, and then that lifetime over contribution allowance is gone. There are some finer rules around that, but basically, basically it comes down to one permitted over contribution of up to $2,000, or a sum total of RSP contributions of up to $2,000. Okay, that's all relatively straightforward now. It's a lot of rules, a lot of detail, but nothing terribly complicated. I do want to introduce one more scenario here. My taxpayer, as it happens, has a spouse. And the spouse for the 2013 tax year has income of $8,000. They just work part-time. Maybe they tend bar at a local pub on weekends or something like that. And they have $8,000 of income as a result. So this person has, times 18% again, $1,440 sorry, one $1, of RRSP deduction room available for that year. However, we want to look at really, is it practical for this person to contribute to an RRSP? The benefits of contributing to an RRSP, of course, are tax deductions and tax deferred income. Well, if you're only making $8,000 a year, you're not paying any tax. That puts you below the basic personal amount. You're not paying any tax at that level of income. So a tax deduction doesn't help because if you're not paying any tax, we can't deduct anything from your tax payable. And tax deferred income doesn't help because at that level of income, you're really not paying any tax. So you might as well just earn taxable income and pay tax on it. The problem then is if this person doesn't invest, if they make no investments, we're going to end up in retirement with the spouse, ultimately with no retirement income, Well, we have everything with the taxpayer over here. The taxpayer will have all the retirement income. And if you remember how the tax brackets work, you'll see that's not terribly efficient. We're generally better off to have two moderate levels of income than we are to have one very high and one very low level of income. 
So the way we're going to, or one of the methods we're going to use to accomplish this, and we will talk about income splitting in more detail elsewhere, but one of the methods we're going to use to accomplish this potentially is maybe have our taxpayer contribute to a spousal RRSP. And by using the spousal RRSP now, we're going to put some income into this person's hands. So now they will have retirement income and our original taxpayer will not have all the retirement income. Instead, we'll have a nice mix. So what happens then is the contributor with the contributor, they're going to use their RRSP room and lose it as a result. And they're going to get the deduction. And then the recipient actually owns the RRSP and what's called a spousal RRSP. They would make the investment decisions. They would decide on any kind of withdrawals. It's their RRSP. Okay, so a lot of concepts covered in this video. We saw the basics of RRSP math. We saw the pension adjustment. We saw the actual calculation of RRSP room, including lifetime over contribution allowance. And we introduced the spousal RRSP. That's a lot of stuff. I hope that it does help you to better understand the RRSP. Please do let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.